Hello and welcome to Small Screen Science, the podcast where we look at the science behind your favourite TV shows. I'm Karen. I'm Emma and oh my god, <laughs> don't know if I pull that off. This episode of the podcast is called The One Where because we are looking at everyone's favourite caffeine fueled sitcoms. It's it's friends, isn't it? And it is. uh, we had to do it at some point, had to do it at some point. Um, and this show actually is coming to you as part of the Discover Science Festival usually held in Wrexham. So thank you very much guys for inviting us to be part of your excellent lineup. Yes, it's very exciting, isn't it? So I, I'd like to ask you a question first, if that's okay. Far away. How are you doing? <laughs> Could I be any more excited? <laughs> oh, really, really I setting think... the tone here, listeners. If you've not yeah. listened to Small Screen Science before, <laughs> more of this nonsense. More. Yeah. Because basically during the show, we, we try and slip in as many puns about the show or show quotes as we possibly can. And there's a couple at the start there. I think I need to practice my Joey though a little bit more, don't you? I mean, I'm almost pleased that it doesn't roll off the tongue because he rolls <laughs> off the tongue because he uses it too much. So maybe, <laughs> oh, maybe yeah. it won't come up too often. Um, yeah, but so we'll give you a full list at the end uh, of the ones that we managed to get in. But also Karen should be in the chat right now. So you can participate with everyone else watching. Drop them in the chat when you spot them and, uh, I don't know, brownie points to you if you're the first person, the first uh, Ultra Friends fan to notice each of them. And pop in some of your own quotes as well if you think we've missed out. <laughs> if we've missed the opportunity to put in yeah. a brilliant quote, pop it in I'm, the chat. I mean, we're 10 seasons <laughs> with like 24 episodes per season. There's so many to choose from. And I yeah. think we've got quite a lot coming up, but I, yeah, I bet we've missed loads. Yeah, yeah bound to have done. Bound to have done. So listen, I mean, friends, mm. we had to do it, didn't we, at some point anyway, because it's super popular. But also this year, the show experienced a bit of a renaissance. Mm. See what you did there? Mm. Yeah. When uh, the uh, the reunion episode, which wasn't really a like a character reunion, it was just like a cast reunion. Yeah. Yeah. Getting them all in the same hoping, room. Yeah. We, I, I mean, perhaps there's the beauty in them not giving the characters another leg of story and just leaving it as it was I reckon you can probably ruin things if you try and revive things too much but, mm. but yeah so it became one of the most streamed things on Netflix all over again yeah yeah well I sat down and I watched all the way through from the beginning to the end and I'd never done that before until it was on Netflix you know just sit down and watch episode after episode after episode and 24 episodes in each season and then 10 seasons That's I mean lot. that is a lot of episodes it's a lot and I don't think I realized until the reunion as well just how massively popular they were and it was back in the day because I did watch it when it came out first um you know after school it was always on like e4 but I don't, I didn't, you know, obsessively watch it. And I certainly didn't watch it all the way through. I just picked it up here and there. But I have to admit, I did watch the entire thing all over again. Because I just thought, listen, if we're going to do it for an episode, I need to refresh my memory. So maybe mm -hmm. I'd just watch a couple here and there. Started with season one, episode one, ended with episode 24, season 10. <laughs> Sat through all of them. Brilliant. <laughs> I mean, like, some of it doesn't age super well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it has got its critics, hasn't it? When you when you look back on what it was like. But I find it hilarious because I've started watching quite a few 90s shows now and the fashion back in the day. Oh, my goodness. Enormous yeah. jackets. Huge jackets. It's what the hair. That about? The hair as well. The hair and the makeup. Uh, it really. I, although, I mean, if we're talking about fashion, I didn't think it was. I struggled to watch it in the sense that every single woman was painfully skinny. Mm. And I was kind of a bit like, oh, I mean, that was one of the clear moments where TV's evolved a little bit and like casts are way more diverse, body shapes are much more diverse. You know, people actually look like normal people. Whereas uh, I think for Friends, they did they did pick like three very kind of beautiful, stereotypical TV women, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a bit of a classic for the back in the day, the American TV shows particularly. Yeah. Um, it was a bit of a bit of a thing. Yeah. Mm. Listen, we've gone off topic already. Um, <laughs> let's get back on with the show because, of course, we have 18 pages front and back of script to get through. <laughs> Lord. So we shoot the script right here. <laughs> so I guess we start with the YouGov poll, don't we? Because where else would you start if you're talking well, about science? I mean, listen, the, one of the first questions anyone asks uh, that comes up around friends is, were they on a break? Yes, what absolutely. What do you reckon, I think they were on a break. Personal, personally, they were on a break. I don't know how you can argue that they weren't on a break because they mm. definitely were. And um, actually, YouGov, so the uh, the polling company that normally asks hard hitting questions, <laughs> did in fact survey <laughs> the general public uh, asking about whether they were on a break. And sixty one percent of people that responded said yes, they were on a break. But interestingly, although people agreed generally that they were on a break, the majority of people said hell no, Ross should still not have slept with. Uh, 
No, that yeah, was, was inappropriate. Sleeping with somebody literally the moment you've broken up is not, not appropriate. Not, not even 24 hours. Not no. that 24 hours is okay, but not even 24 no. hours. No. Oh, shocking um, behavior. So, so yeah, you see, uh, we were on a break. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> I love, oh, dear. I can't even remember where that came from, but it's so funny. So, it, was, so funny. Oh, it was when Ross and Monica weren't allowed to swear at each other using the oh, finger when they were kids. So Ross yes. invented the like. Invented that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So um, one of the BuzzFeed quizzes that does the rounds, I don't know, at least every year. Uh, which friend are you? Do you reckon? Do you think that you associate more to one of the friends than the others or? I'm afraid I am a Ross. I am a geeky scientist. Oh my God, you are. I am such a <laughs> such a Ross. <laughs> definitely a ross yeah you are shocking i don't know i think i can associate with quite a lot of them i think mm. i'm sure that's why i'm sure we all can and that's why we yeah. enjoy the characters i think i'm quite sarcastic and self-depreciating so probably lean towards chandler mm-hmm. but um i don't know i think i can I'm, i can be a bit of a hippie as well although i've not been known to sing awful songs in cafes so yeah. <laughs> well apparently, well, so, apparently so apparently uh when when surveyed people mm. think they're most like chandler or monica Mm-hmm. And Chandler is the most popular friend, but interestingly, Monica is the least. So a lot of people will say, yeah, I'm like Monica, but I hate her. So yeah, which is interesting, interesting. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, a little insight into the human mind. <laughs> <laughs> so a bit more specifically about science. I mean, data mining, data scientists, you know, looking at big data. So a data scientist has examined every single episode of Friends. They've looked at, you know, how, how many words people are saying, how many speeches they've got, how much time they've had on screen, how many times their name's been mentioned to try and work out, actually, of the six friends, who is the key focus mm. of the show? Who's so, the main character? Exactly. So who would you say was the main character of the show? Now, I, I, don't, think that, I don't think there's one. I think because it it's having having watched the finale very recently <laughs> it pretty much all hinges on Ross and Rachel and to be yeah. honest even from the very beginning the entire thing has been well they won't they and if they do how long and you know it's so I think Ross and Rachel even though yeah. the others go through some really dramatic storylines as well I think the entire thing is them yeah and it is and they're the ones that get most of the screen time you know if you look at all of the big data it is all about them but ah. Ross just edges it so the show is all about Ross. He's my least favourite, though. No offence to you. As <laughs> well, a, thanks. As a Rosser. <laughs> as a Rosser, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I guess I can kind of see why he's had so mm. much screen time. I mean, he had like three weddings to get through, didn't he? That, yeah, this is true. A yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of storyline. Yeah. Um, okay, right. Come on. Let's, um, let's, let's get on with the podcast now. Do you think science can answer why friends is important now friends with a lowercase f not friends to show why Mm -hmm. we need friends as human beings yeah well humans are you know have evolved to to thrive in social environments you know to interact with people and actually you know 150 people seems to be about the limit and if you think about it if you go back to pre-industrial friends But if you go back to pre-industrial revolution times, you know, that would have been your community, basically, mm. wouldn't it? It would have been your little village, whole village. Um, knowing everybody and, and socialising with people. So when we're talking about friends in this context and social interactions, we're also talking about, you know, you chat to your hairdresser, you chat to your, mm. you know, you might chat to the person the on the grocery. till and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it's those kind of social interactions that are really important. And it's been shown in research that friendship leads to release of hormones like dopamine, serotonin and oxytocin. Now, for those of you who've not listened to our podcast before, go back and have a listen to the Love Island episode because we go into a lot of detail about these hormones, don't we, relating we do. to, to love and friendship. Yeah. So, yeah, it's worth a listen. All of our like bonding hormones, those feel good chemicals. Yeah. yeah. Um, and interestingly, a study carried out in 2006 had a look at people's like pain threshold or pain tolerance level, which is often associated with these hormones um, and the kind of the size of their social network, not digital social network, like actual number of friends. Um, and they found that if you had a look at people's pain threshold, you could use that to predict how many people they were friends with and how many people were in their little social bubble, which is really interesting. Yeah, Bit really mad, weird, but really quite weird. Cool. I mean, why would you try and associate? I suppose it's because it's dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin, yeah. isn't it? So, so you would think about pain threshold, but fancy carrying out a study. Like imagine, into that. imagine that experiment. You've got someone <laughs> strapped to a chair. You're like prodding them with needles and something. It's like, how, how many, many friends, friends do you have? How many friends? 
was electrocuting them. Absolutely How many nuts. friends? Tell me. I'm yeah, friend. absolutely nuts. <laughs> there you go. That's science for you. That is science. Um, so if you look at friends more generally, if we go back back in the day, Greek philosophy, because uh, pretty much everything starts there, doesn't it? Ar- um, and we're talking about Aristotle here. And what Aristotle did was he sat down and thought about friendships and he and he kind of categorized them in three different groups, which are really interesting. So he said, you've got utility friends. So these are kind of um, friends like uh, your hairdresser, which we mentioned earlier, you know, so you'll go along and you'll really chat to them, but you could drop them at any point, you know, and it wouldn't yeah, really matter like to you so much. you, don't they? Exactly. Yeah, so you're based on this exchange them. of something. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you're not really thinking about that person, but there's, there's definitely this exchange. Oh, like, um, I care passionately about my hairdresser. Oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let, I'll let them know. Um, but, but interestingly, family relationships come underneath this as it's does interesting. Yeah. hospitality towards strangers so inviting someone into your house you might be very polite with them and very friendly with them but again as soon as they leave your house you're not really going to think about it overly much so that's kind of this utility friendship um, the second one is the pleasure friendship and this tends to be very much amongst young people and it's about you know who you might game with so you might have a group of gamer friends that you're actually online with you're gaming with on a regular basis you consider them to be friends but if you switched games and they didn't switch with you you develop a new group of friends mm. you know who, who played the new game um, so so that's kind of this pleasure Uh, friendship and then the last one is the pursuit of good so this is what you'd consider to be a proper friendship you're thinking about the other person you're caring about the other person Um, and actually these are considered quite rare which is very interesting Um, and the reason why Aristotle felt they were rare was because there are very few good people in the world and you have to be a good person to have a pursuit of good friendship and if you're a bad person you're not interested in this type of friendship. You're only interested in the utility and the pleasure friendships. I can almost hear everyone listening now re-evaluating all of their friendships and thinking, well, am I good? <laughs> <laughs> am, I good am I a good friend? <laughs> am, I, am I a good person? Um, but basically what you're saying is that a good friend will be there. You know, there's someone who'll support you when it hasn't been your day, your week, your month, or even your year. Yeah, and they'll be there for you when the rain starts to pour Good Lord, we have out cringed ourselves this time. <laughs> Let's put those away. So, moving swiftly on. Um, why do we find things funny? Let's use science to explain why we find things funny. Yeah, so um, in actual fact, we, we discuss this in a lot of detail in our Brooklyn Nine-Nine episode. So go back and listen to that if you're really interested. You're but really they were plugging, th- really yes. plugging. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> go and listen to our other episodes. Um, so actually, there are three different um, theories of comedy, aren't there? Yes, yeah, so the psychologists have looked at this. It's really interesting. And there are so these three theories, for example, the first one is superiority. And this is the idea that we find things funny because we like to feel superior to a character. Yeah. So Joey is the classic here. We all feel superior. So whenever he does anything daft, the reason why we find it funny is because we feel superior to him as a character. Mm. Um, so that's why he's funny. Yeah. And one of the other ones is repression. And this is the idea that we find things funny that we aren't normally allowed to talk about in society. So if things are a little bit taboo, so things like sex or like poo, we find toilet humor really funny. We find sex jokes really funny because that is our outlet for having those conversations or or having those topics in our lives because we can't do it in, you know, normal, you know, in the the queue to the bus stop or something. Yeah. Um, And the next one, the third theory of comedy is incongruity. And this is kind of where something doesn't fit in a situation or there's this mismatch of two different ideas or situations. So, for example, if you were to come downstairs and open the fridge and you found a bowling ball in the fridge, that might be funny because it's incongruous. Because why would there be a bowling ball in the fridge? How did it get there? (laughs) It's incongruous. It's funny. Yeah. But actually, sometimes incongruous can go the wrong way and create a fear component. So if you were to come downstairs and open the fridge, and there was a severed head in the fridge it is incongruous but my god is it not funny that is terrifying yeah that is is too much of this situational mismatch for me no and it's and it's also based on cultural expectations as well isn't it incongruity so that you have to have an expectation of what you would find in your fridge um Mm. and therefore in order for the bowling ball or the severed head to be incongruous to that so it's very much about the culture that you've been brought up in and your personal values are linked very very closely to incongruity aren't they yeah and that explains why you and i perhaps if we were watching the same thing 
might not find the same things funny. Uh, researchers have noticed that you can recognize a joke, but there's a two step process. So um, you recognize it, but then you also decide to laugh at it. And the decision to laugh at it is where you apply your own cultural experiences. So, you know, you might be absolutely wetting yourself at something in France and I might be looking at you like, God, <laughs> really? Is that and really funny? It's because, because I've made I can the see it's a joke. Is a fun, it's yeah, I can funny. see which bit you're laughing at, but I'm not there with you. Exactly. Hmm. But um, incongruity actually comes up quite often in sitcoms and it's, you know, Friends is no exception. So yeah, one of, absolutely. One of the weird examples of this is quite interesting. It's um, in the very, you know, in the very first episode when Rachel appears in everyone's lives and mm. she's on the phone to her dad and she's saying, what if I don't want to be a shoe? What if I want to be a purse, you know, or a hat? Yeah, and you wouldn't think, because this is a very subtle form of incongruity, because most cultures would separate out um, your moral values from material possessions. So you'd, you'd separate those out completely. And what she's done in that scene is pulled them both together. Mm -hmm. So she wants you to see her as somebody who's capable and who's thoughtful. But actually, by using her material possessions as an example, she's actually showing you how superficial she is as a character and how her father reacts to her as well, suggests that her, her character is, is very superficial. So that's a type of incongruity and that's the reason why we find it funny, but it's much more subtle than the other examples. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's about time that we pivot and talk <laughs> about coffee. I love, that scene. I love that scene. It's pivot, so pivot, painful pivot, to watch. Pivot, pivot. <laughs> watching it again recently remembering because uh, one of the benefits of watching it again recently having not seen it for 10 years or so is I'd forgotten quite a lot of it but that one I had not forgotten and it was so painful to watch mm. oh gosh yeah but um yeah so anyway we need to talk about coffee next I think yes. because they pretty much live in Central Perk I mean how they afford to live on coffee and spend all their money in coffee shops while being young and often unemployed in New York I don't know but and and how you know what is the science behind or the maths behind the size of their apartment that is a key question that we don't have the answer to no. how can how can they afford an apartment that size well some blessing from her grandma wasn't it or something mm, that's yeah, how they even loosely so, loosely got around it enormous. it was huge yeah so if we go to Central Perk then um, if you think, you know, we, we they've been in there from episode one, weren't they? Because that's when Rachel came in. She came running in in her uh, wedding dress, didn't mm. she? Um, so we know caffeine is a stimulant. We know that it, it um, has an effect on our central nervous system. It can increase your blood pressure. It can increase your heart rate. I mean, we know all of these things. But, but why does it do that? And the reason is it's an adenosine blocker. Um, so it attaches to the adenosine receptors and it causes the neurons in your brain to fire more than they would normally. Um, and this um, causes the pituitary gland to release adrenaline. And it's and of course, we know if you have a lot of adrenaline in your body, then that's going to increase your, your heart rate and your blood pressure and all that kind of stuff. So, so that's why it has the impact it does. Yeah, so apparently 99% of all caffeine that you ingest is absorbed and distributed to all of your tissues and your organs. So if I'm perfectly honest, I don't know how they slept judging by the amount of time that they spent. Yeah. But I, don't think, I don't think I remember them ever ordering a decaf. I remember lots of muffins and lots of coffee. Yeah. Um, but interestingly, a really big study looked at basically all scientific papers uh, that had looked at caffeine and it the impacts. Interestingly, an umbrella study. I really wondered it... what, you were, what you were doing. <laughs> She's going off so, script. Um, umbrella study, because yeah. it, it combined together 201 different meta-analysis, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and the results of this mega umbrella study uh, was that it found that basically roasted coffee has a really complicated mixture of over 1,000 bioactive compounds in it. it sounds like quite a lot. Yeah, and a lot, they all yeah. have different effects. So some of them are kind of potentially antioxidants. Some of them are anti-inflammatory, some are anti-fibrotic, some are even anti-cancer agents. Um, so, and, and interestingly, you know, you hear quite a lot, oh, you shouldn't drink too much coffee. And I think obviously too much of anything can be bad. Mm. But um, coffee consumption according to this study, is more often associated with benefit than it is harm. And a lot of studies had a look at things like uh, how much you drink, whether you were someone who drank loads or very little or none at all. Um, and more often than not, there was no consistent evidence of kind of harmful associations between coffee consumption and like, health outcomes, apart from there being obviously some cases in that, you know, pregnant women perhaps shouldn't drink coffee and things. Yeah. And, and then randomly, an increased risk of fracture in women if you drink too much coffee. 
Yeah, what a strange one. Yeah, I've never heard of that before, but there you go. Yeah, um, that on the label. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the more you drink, the more tolerance to its effects you you become like any drug you know if you take any drug over a long period of time you become tolerant towards it um and actually in terms of metabolizing caffeine um we talk about it in terms of half-life so mm. if you were to uh, consume 100 milligrams of coffee you know what would the half-life be how long would it take your body to break it down so you've got 50 milligrams left in your body and believe it or not the half-life of coffee is around five hours which is actually more than I expected. Mm, it's a long time, isn't it? Yeah. And that's only reducing it by half. So, so this you know, is why they say don't drink ca- caffeine in the afternoons. Mm, yeah, just just because it does have an impact on your sleep and your sleep patterns. Mm. Um, but caffeine is broken down in your body by enzymes produced by the liver in a very similar way to you know to alcohol breaking down alcohol in the body as well. Mm. And sticking with the science, um, mm. thinking about where caffeine actually comes from. Uh, we obviously know that coffin, coffin, coffee beans, <laughs> coffin beans. I don't know what a coffin bean would be. Anyway, um, obviously we know that we get coffee from beans. Beans grow on a plant. Um, so why is it that you know these plants actually produce caffeine in the first place? Like what what effect does that have for the plant? And what researchers have found is that obviously all plants compete for pollination so mm-hmm. that they can produce their seeds and start the next generation. And bees will actually remember and revisit plants that give them caffeinated nectar more often than plants that do not provide a caffeine source, which Mm. is fantastic. So basically, if you're a plant, if you're able to produce caffeine, you're more likely to get pollinated. Yeah. And that's because it improves bees memory. Awesome, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know amazing. if it helps my memory, but it's good about the bees. <laughs> it's good about the bees. Mm. Um, and, and caffeine is what we call a methyl xanthine. And many um, methyl xanthines are used as pesticides by humans and by plants. So one of the other theories of why ca- there's caffeine in plants is, is to help it, um, you know, protect itself against pests. Yeah, very cool. Mm. Very cool. But anyway, right, we're going to pivot again um i think actually what we should do is we're going to travel through time we're going to start in season one follow our way through to season 10 and we're going to hop through some of our favorite science or science adjacent moments. science adjacent yes science i think adjacent. a lot of science adjacent mm, yeah yeah not too much <laughs> actual science in friends mm. um but we're going to start in season one with an episode called the one with two parts part one and this is where uh, Phoebe's twin sister makes her first appearance. This is Ursula. Yeah. And Joey and Chandler can't tell the two of them apart. Yeah, they're, they're, because they are identical. Well, we know they're played by the same actress, well, so they yeah, are going to be identical. Of course they're identical. Um, but actually, there's uh, we like to explore the Ig Nobles, don't we, on our podcast. So this is a series of awards that are given out for really unusual science. Um, and one scientific Quite study, ridiculous science sometimes, yeah, some, yeah. Of, some of it's completely bonkers, isn't it? Um, so this one we found was um, they, they demonstrated that identical twins struggled to tell each other apart visually. So if they looked at two photographs of, you know, them and their sibling of just the face, they found it really difficult to, to see if it was them or if it was their twin. And if you think about it, when you look at yourself, you are looking at yourself in the mirror. And, and when you when you have a photograph, it's a mirror image of yourself, isn't it? It's basically what you look like to everyone else, but it's not the view that you would normally mm. see. So it's really so you would see when you were looking at your twin, that's what you would see is yourself in them. So that's why they find it really difficult to tell the difference. But it's quite an interesting study. Yeah, it's quite cool. That's quite mm. cool. Because you, you would, I think, without thinking about it, you would assume that twins, identical twins would know each other the best in the world. But no, that's that's pretty interesting. But um. I mean, we can't talk about Phoebe without talking about Smelly Cat. There are so many iconic scenes where she is, I want to use the term singing loosely, (laughs) um, crooning in the corner of Central Mm. Park or on some street corner, um, some very bizarre songs. So, Mm. you know, the first time we actually heard Smelly Cat was in season two. I can't believe that. It feels kind of iconic. You you would assume that it had come right from the beginning, didn't you? It actually didn't come until season two in an episode called The One With The Baby On The Bus. Mm. Yeah. And of course, we need so we need to examine smelly cats and if you know what is the science behind yeah, we smelly need cats. To, we need course. to do that. Yes, it's very important. Um, so cats in themselves aren't smelly, no. uh, but we know that their urine and their marking is very smelly. Now I've got cats, and I know when they mark, it absolutely reeks. It's disgusting. Um, and the reason is um, this is this is good. So they they produce an amino acid which is released in the urine called 
uh, felanine or felanine f-e-l-i-n-i-n-e so it just feline. looks like you've spelt feline wrong doesn't it exactly yeah, yeah. um so this is a an amino acid and that breaks down into something called a thiol now i'm going to try and name the thiol go on um so we'll give it a go it's three mercapto three methyl butan one ol or M- done. mmb just to make it easier to say yeah, MMB. MMB. Um, an MMB is a cat pheromone. Um, it's highly volatile. It's got a strong smell and there doesn't need to be very many parts per million for us as humans to be able to smell it. So you can imagine what it's like for cats. Um, so it's um, interestingly, MMB is also found in Sauvignon Blanc. Double interestingly. I wouldn't have said Sauvignon Currently Blanc. I have that in my mug. So oh, nice. I'll be um, honest, that's put me off. My wine, but it doesn't. Slightly. I wouldn't say it smell of cat pee, but Sauvignon Blanc does have a little bit of a strange I, odor to it. I, I've certainly never smelt a glass of white wine and said, "Hmm, smells hmm. like next door's cat." <laughs> um, but I'll be honest, it's gonna it's gonna be in my mind from now on. You might you might have ruined wine for me. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's important to note that although this smell is like produced by the cat. The cat itself isn't smelly. So if you mm. at home have a cat and your cat itself is indeed smelly, take it to the vet would be the recommended advice. It could be a sign of disease or an infected wound or, you know, an ear infection or ear d- infection is the classic. Yeah. It can't, ear infection or dental normally. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Not good. Take them to the vet. Take them to the vet. Shall we move on to something a little bit more heartwarming? Um, yes. So do you remember the one with the prom video? I love oh. the prom video episode. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and all of their throwbacks were so funny so funny yes. especially, especially watching the guys when they were you know clearly a lot older but trying to play college kids maybe and with the lot. with all of the 80s the long uh, hair and the like yeah facial hair yeah, yeah but I, okay, well in this episode we learned that it is a known fact that lobsters mm-hmm. fall in love and they make for life you can yeah. actually see old lobster couples walking around their tank holding claws Sorry, it's not true. Phoebe, not just the holding claws thing. Obviously, they don't hold claws, uh, but they don't make for life either. It's disappointing, isn't it? I no, feel lied to. I. This is one fact that I feel like a lot of people have learned from friends and they've learned it wrong. And maybe it's sent off uh, like a, a spiral of um, misinformation through a couple of generations, which is a bit <laughs> sad. Um, so actually what happens is that a female lobster will release, will release lots of pheromones when they're like ready to mate. So mm-hmm. in the water around them, any males near them can smell it and then they can fight each other for the, the pleasure of mating with her. Yeah, and what she does, and this is really... Mm. really risque i would say well this the risk is, is risque she does a little strip tease so she must <laughs> <laughs> she literally does oh my god yes she loses her loses her shell i mean imagine how vulnerable she she is at that point yeah. and actually the male does protect her so mm. he's very protective of her at that point um and then what he does is he deposit deposits sperm packets into her sperm pouch and then what she will do with that sperm is fertilize her eggs and then she stores the fertilized eggs underneath her tail um until they finally hatch um baby lobsters though i mean baby lobsters it would be quite sweet if they were little tiny little tiny pincers yeah. like this but they're not they're like larvae which is i'm really disappointed by that i'm a little bit sad by that many yeah. sad things about lobsters this episode um yeah and then so yeah the male will you know look after her then but then they will just move on to the next female yeah so they don't they don't practice long-term monogamy at all no so it's more like serial monogamy um because he does protect her while she's vulnerable but as soon as he's you know um given her his sperm pouch um then that's it he's on to the next lady yeah um so it's serial monogamy but then if you think about ross he is a lobster because he does that serial monogamy with all his marriages and yes, everything, isn't he? Yes, mm. he is. Ross the divorcer. He is indeed. <laughs> He's a lobster. <laughs> He's a lobster, he? Absolutely lies. <laughs> um, so back to more science facts that did appear in the show. Mm-hmm. This one is not science adjacent. This one actually did, did yeah. appear. Um, and Ross, again, being the spearhead of this one. Um, let's take it to smells. Um, mm-hmm. And this is the episode where Ross can't flirt. And essentially, <laughs> again, one of the more painful things to watch is Ross fancying a female pizza delivery mm. lady who turns up the pizzas and he's re- there like ready and waiting, trying to flirt. And one of the things that he talks about uh, is gas. Yeah. 
Yeah. He says, you know, I bet you didn't know that they put an artificial smell in gas. They put yeah. the smell in gas. Like, they put who, smell in gas. I don't know why <laughs> you thought that would work. I think if he'd Amazing. sang it to her, it would work better. Really? Smelling gas, smelling gas. What are they adding to you? No? <laughs> That would only work though if she'd seen Friends. Oh Otherwise yes, it'd come from an even more mental. <laughs> oh lord. Okay, um, that is a parody that someone needs to do. If not, that needs to. Be we have to come up with a full. Mm. We have to come up with the full lyrics, won't we, for the whole yeah. tune? Um, <laughs> so natural gas is true. This doesn't have an odor. Mm. So it is. You know, Ross's fact, non-flirtatious fact, is is absolutely true. They do put an artificial smell in a totally harmless smell. Um, just so that you can tell if there's been a gas leak. Which I think yeah. is very sensible. It's called mercaptan or methane thiol. So it's another thiol, like mm. the cat cat pee, um, cat pee chemical. Mm. Um, cat pee chemical. Uh, and it's got a M-M-D. strong <laughs> it's got a strong sulfur-like smell. And again, we don't need very many parts per million for us to smell it. And that's important because obviously, mm. you know, it's important that you notice a gas leak as soon as possible. Pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And uh, speaking of uh, smelly peas, again, um, <laughs> it's also actually a byproduct of the metabolism of asparagus. So, you yeah. know, um, it's some some people, uh, if you eat asparagus and then you go to the toilet, you might see uh, a change in the smell of your urine. Yeah, but not everybody. So everybody does it in terms of producing methane thiol in the urine. Mm. Um, and sometimes uh, as early as 15 minutes after you've eaten asparagus, it's in your oh, urine, which is rapid. really yeah. very quick metabolism, isn't it? Um, but not everybody can smell asparagus wee. Mm. And I just have to say, I can smell asparagus wee and you can as well. It's yeah. not a matter of sitting there with your head in the toilet sniffing. It is literally <laughs> you're sat on the toilet and you can smell it. It is. <laughs> It's it's that for, the, for those for those yeah. that don't smell asparagus we uh you're lucky i think yes <laughs> um yeah mm. uh should we should we bash ross a little bit more i think so yeah we might as well while we're on i think on the, the i mean the script writers clearly did because they've given us a lot to work with yeah um okay they wrote him an episode where well he whitened his teeth so much that they glow well they didn't glow in the dark they glowed under back black light didn't they yeah. they were almost like bioluminescent <laughs> teeth, like a caricature of a bad tooth yeah. whitening job. And I think in order to do that, they must have added optical brightness. Um, and our optical brighteners are found in detergents. So when you wash your clothes mm. in detergents with optical brighteners in, um, they will glow under UV light. And this is because they contain a chemical called an optical brightener. Um, and what that does is it absorbs uh, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that are in the ultraviolet and the violet ranges and then emits it in this kind of blue region. And what that does, when we look at it under UV light, so in the sun, it makes whites look really bright white to us. And therefore, you know, it can cause a whitening effect in your whites um, mm. and, you know, in your clothing. And that's why, you know, sometimes if you go to, I'm going to be really old school now, go out to a disco uh, and they use black light. And sometimes your white T-shirts will glow in the dark in a similar way. And that's because of the optical brightness. Ah, OK. Mm. Yes. No, I don't remember discos um even if i was the kind of person that went to discos quite often certainly haven't been for a year and a half um, <laughs> yeah so um teeth whitening products will often contain hydrogen peroxide you know something that we also use to bleach our hair um, mm-hmm. or carbamide peroxide um and hydrogen peroxide is much more fast acting um and although carbamide peroxide is slower acting it leaves your teeth with uh, less sensitivity so this is often mm. one of the things that people will report after they've had their teeth whitened that they'll 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 be really sensitive and they'll have a lot of pain um yeah. but what's interesting is you know you get the kind of classic hollywood white uh this like blazing white smile <laughs> yeah. like what ross was aiming for <laughs> um this actually is kind of based on a lie like our teeth are not white and one of the reasons why the hollywood smile looks ridiculous in my eyes is because it's completely it, we're not supposed to have blindingly white teeth our teeth the natural color of them is actually more of an off-white it's more like bone so mm. And the colour itself is caused by the dentin layer of teeth. So you've got different layers in your teeth and actually the enamel, the top layer, the one that we always worry about getting rubbed away. And when that goes, we get sensitive teeth. It's actually translucent. So the white colour comes from the dentin, which is the layer underneath, which shows through the enamel. Yeah. And actually um, the colour of your teeth is partly genetic, but it's also partly environmental. So, Mm. you know, if you drink lots of tea, lots of coffee, 
a red wine, for example, then that'll obviously stain your teeth. If you smoke, that'll stain your teeth as well. Um, but natural color teeth have a range of different colors. And what um, dentists have done is they've divided them into four key areas, which they're labeled as A to D. Um, so A is reddish brown in color, B is reddish yellow, C is gray, and D is reddish gray. Um, and obviously, this is the color of the dentin. So you have this whole range of different colors of dentin and they're a lightness shade within those colors. So you'd get like A1234, for example, um, just to give you, you know, a different range of colors of teeth. Yeah. So apparently when you go to a professional teeth whitening service, um, they will line you up with this like rack of different like false teeth, essentially, <laughs> um, which have different colors to find out which color you're naturally most like so that then they can um, change the grade within that that scale. So um, yeah. apparently B1 is the one that everyone aims for. So a, a light reddish yellow. Mm, I have to admit, when you're talking about teeth, telling me that teeth are reddish brown or gray makes me feel a bit uneasy yeah. <laughs> yeah but if you if you google images of that that little teeth rack you can see that there, it isn't mostly a white color but it's mm. just this shade a that, that the teeth tint. have got yeah exactly mm. um so i think it's time for the final pivot of the session um and we need to move to the show finale don't we yeah. and and one of uh joey's classic lines which is you can't just give up is that what a dinosaur would do yeah i mean we felt that we really had to touch on paleontology at some point because <laughs> it, it kind of is the only real science in the show, uh, all leading through one character. So paleontology is a form of science which kind of lies between biology and geology. And it has a look at essentially a record of past life, mostly looking at things like fossils and rocks to give us that information. Yeah. And it led to my favourite nerdy joke of the whole show, which I absolutely love and we have to do now. Um, no, Homo habilis was erect. Australopithecus was never fully erect. Well, maybe he was nervous. <laughs> Actually, just so you know, it's not that common. It doesn't happen to every guy. And it is a big deal. <laughs> one of my, sorry, one of my all time favourite Rachel moments. Love yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So he thought those two went really, really well together. <laughs> but, OK, back, back to your joke. Uh, there was there was a few terms in there that I think needed explaining. Yeah, so um, it's all to do with human human evolution or evolution of the hominids or the mm. hominid family. Um, and Australopithecus evolved in West Africa about four million years ago. And Australopithecus wasn't fully erect, so it didn't stand completely upright, hence the pun. Mm. Um, whereas Homo habilis uh, lived about 2.8 to 1.4 million years ago, so much more recently. Um, they've got smaller molars, a larger brain, so heading kind of towards the Homo sapiens. Um, and they made tools from stone and maybe used animal bones as well to make tools too. Um, but they were much more, you know, they were walking much more erect when compared to the Australopithecus. They were mm. upright. Mm. Um, and on, on that note, um, mm. we're reaching the end yep. of this lovely, lovely podcast. And as part of the podcast, what we like to do towards the end is shine a light on some of the weirder research that we found um, because there is a surprising amount of what often seems like fairly nonsensical research that is genuinely mm. published in peer review papers and it just it just needs a good round of applause sometimes so <laughs> <laughs> first of all we're going back to the ignobles which are those yep. kind of ridiculous science prizes that we found do, over, do uh, look yeah. them up if you get the opportunity have a look at the ignobles because some so of funny. the honestly some of the some of the research is hilarious it, it's brilliant it, it makes I mean I wish I would teach that in schools because it would make science seem way more interesting <laughs> um, maybe we'd get more people going into science careers mm. um, but so one that one of these prizes the Ignobles was uh, awarded for a study in 2014 which basically found that if you put a weighted stick kind of if you attached it to the like rear end of a chicken it would cause the chicken to walk like more upright <laughs> how, <laughs> basically how how dinosaurs are thought to have walked like whose job was that <laughs> round up the chickens <laughs> and like attach a stick to their tails this is mad this is mad but of course the kind of funny link here is that obviously birds are are dinosaurs that yeah you know, they're theropods exactly i know <laughs> no. oh, very good yeah i can't yeah. really i can't really do nobody can do it like monica no nobody can do it like monica uh, yeah um, <laughs> so i guess we ought to um we ought to as we finish advise people to go away and to achieve unagi I don't know which was it. Did I do it the right Unagi. way? Unagi. Unagi. I don't know. It doesn't matter because way. it's totally made up. 
Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> unagi is a state of total awareness. Only by achieving true unagi will you be prepared for any danger that may befall you. Yeah, and actually, it's nothing to do with that at all. It's a Japanese <laughs> eel, or Japanese word for a freshwater eel, and nothing to do with karate, as yeah. most would say. That episode does always make me crave sushi. <laughs> um, and on that note, that is pretty much all we've got time for today, so we really hope that you've enjoyed it. And if you have... Go and listen to some of our other podcast episodes. We've got three whole seasons. We've got things from Silent Witness, Love Island, uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine. What are your, what are some of your favourites? Um, I like the Sewing Bee. I love that the British Great Sewing Pottery Bee. Great Pottery Throwdown. Yeah. yeah. Strictly Planet. Come Dancing. We've done yeah. a real range mm. of shows that you might not think there's much science <laughs> adjacent to them, but we find it, listeners. Oh yes, we do. yes. We we like we to pick up it. pick up the challenge of finding science in any show you like. Yeah. Um, so uh, the big question is though is uh, a prize for those of you that spotted all of the show quotes, and we're going to go through. There are absolutely loads of them in this you episode. Have to take aren't a they? deep breath for this. <laughs> okay, we had you at the beginning. How are you doing? And How are you I doing? Be more excited. <laughs> <laughs> we had a renaissance i don't think a renaissance is a quote so maybe no. that shouldn't be in there but that was a fun little term it was a fun in. little term yeah mm. i managed to get in janice right at the beginning oh my god uh yeah you shouted i know mm. oh good lord i'm terrible at these we had 18 pages of script to get through front and back we had we were on a break mm-hmm. we we spoke the lyrics to the theme tune complete with umbrellas which i think gave us brownie points We had, what if I don't want to be a shoe? What if I want to be a purse, you know, or a hat? (laughs) Good Lord, we pivoted so many times. So many pivots, so many pivots. We had the lobster quote, which I'm not going to read out in full again. (laughs) Uh, We had Ross the Divorcer, enjoyed that. See, Mm -hmm. he's her lobster. (laughs) Smelling gas, smelling gas. Smelling gas, what are they adding to you? That one. I thought that was going to be a one-off when it made it back. I love it. I'm gonna I'm gonna crop that bit out and just save it. Um, <laughs> we had you wouldn't just give up. Is that what a dinosaur would do? The no Homo habilis was erect. Austral opithicus. Op- Ostropithecus. Ostropithecus was never fully erect. <laughs> well, maybe he was just nervous. Just so you know, it is not that common. It doesn't happen to everyone, and it is a big deal. Unangi is a total state of awareness only by achieving true Unangi can you be prepared for any danger that may befall you and I think that that is a full list I think so quite a lot I think it's a lot yeah yeah I think we did quite well there actually Mm. yeah so as we said you know if you really enjoyed this episode do go back and listen to some more um you can subscribe to our podcast and obviously review any episodes that you happen to listen to that would be brilliant Yep, and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're probably most active on Twitter, I would say. And we're always up for suggestions. So if you've got Mm. any shows that you'd like us to have a look at, let us know. And we hope to see you soon. Yeah, so we did the sewing bee because uh, one of our followers suggested it. So definitely suggest shows. We did indeed. Mm. Yeah, well, thank you very much for listening. And um, hopefully we'll see you at another event. Bye.